Hallo ihr Rabauken. I was in Odder. That's a city in Norway. And that's the city where they shot the uh, Netflix series Ragnarok in, so the Netflix original. And uh, in this video I will explain why I think that from a filmmaking perspective Netflix Ragnarok is one of the, the best originals uh, of the past years and why you can learn a lot from it from a filmmaking perspective if you take a deep dive into it. So I just had um, two days, end of July, uh, July in order, which was kind of uh, four weeks before the release of the, the final season. So I'm recording now 10 days before they uh, releasing the, the final season, which is season three. And uh, in the series, uh, Oda is named Edda. And I really fell in love with Ragnarok when I did something what I call location stalking. So whenever I see a nice location online in a YouTube video most of the time, I'm trying to, to find this location on Google Maps using Google Maps and uh, Google Street View most of the time. So, so when I started to, to do this uh, location stalking with Ragnarok, I uh, quickly found out that most of the locations in the story uh, exist in real life and they are also serving the same purpose as they are being portrayed in, in the series. So like the school is the school, the church is the church of Oda, the fast food restaurant exists in real life, it's called Oda Grillen, uh, the petrol station uh, exists, the Utul factory exists, the barbershop of Gree's mother uh, is, is in real life also a, a barbershop, the, the supermarket exists, this in-mountain sports facility with the, the, the running lane or running track exists, the police station is the police station, they just uh, used the entrance next to the entrance of the police station, which is, I think, when I understood it correctly or Google translated it correctly, is the uh, district court. Every location is actually real in order with serving the same purpose as being portrayed in the series. So this started me, me thinking uh, right from the beginning, if um, the script was written to the location, or if the script was first and they did some location scouting and they will simply be lucky. I think they uh, wrote the, the story to the location, which uh, I just recently found in an interview by either the, uh, the, the actor who played Fjord or Lauritz and they confirmed that they actually the, the story was written to the location basically. So um, why is uh, Ragnarok so special in my opinion? Um, it's because it's, uh, it stands out in comparison to, to other fantasy movies and, and series and originals that are out there, which I watched in the past, uh, because I felt that in the past most of these uh, films and, and series, they were, the story was written around CGI and VFX work. So like the, the CGI and the effects were, were planned first and then they simply needed a story for this, okay? Uh, and, and most of the places displayed in, in these other st uh, stories, they, they don't exist in real life. No? Or they did so much uh, um, set extensions that you, you wouldn't find it in the way as they've been displayed. And then um, also the, the actors are really overacting and the screenplay uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's so full of, of, of items supporting the story that it's, it's really so obvious that in most cases you can start guessing how uh, it all will end simply because everything is so, so made that everybody understands this, okay? So you can really guesstimate what was happening in the future. With Ragnarok it's, it's completely different. Story is king, location is king, acting is very organic, uh, CGI, VFX, the sound design is only used very carefully to support the story, okay? The lens choices and uh, perspective uh, or point of view they are using in combination with the sound design and the, the color grading, it, it, they're using it to create these vibes. So it's really good craft work. Okay, that's why I think you can learn so much from it when you take a deep dive. So um, let's go through it step by step. Uh, so the, the, the first item would be the location. Okay, so 
Odder, Odder the, the real city of Odder is a pretty, pretty small city. So it's about two kilometers long, 800 meters in width, and uh, with a lake on one end and the fjord on the other hand, and very steep mountains uh, on the sides, basically. So, and then on, on the lake side, you've got this massive, massive U2 mansion, which does exist in Odder. There is a very, very huge mansion same place where the the Util mansion is, just the the visuals are a little bit different, so they used CGI to to change it, and I think they only kept the the base floor. But it's it's massive, it's really massive, and it's watching the whole city. You are you're really feeling watched because you can see this building from nearly anywhere from from within the city. Then on the fjord side, you've got the U2 factory on the peninsula. This Factory also exists and it's got exactly the visual experience like, like in the series. I think they, they added some small items sometimes. But these, these plums of, of smoke and steam, they exist. So they're, they're moving very, very slowly, slowly coming up, etc. So as you can see here, so that's, I recorded that one. And um, in addition, there is a very low frequency growl uh, present uh, all the time that's caused by some distant waterfalls plus by the the river that's connecting the lake to uh, the fjord and from from time to time adding to the scroll you can hear some kind of clang from from the factory and but it's 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 it's, it's the appearance is so calm and in combination with with these surrounding sounds it's 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 mythical and Quite intimidating, okay? And so with the factory on, on one end and the mansion on the other end of the city, you are kind of trapped within the city, okay? Surrounded by the Utul clan, or aka the giants, okay? This, this, this setup, it's, it's screaming for use me as a, uh, a, a movie set or a film set. It's incredible, incredible. And then... Um, Secondly, the, the lens choices and the, the, the point of view or angle of view, uh, perspective, how you want to call it, they controlled very, very well what's visible uh, in the background when you're, when you're shooting something to create the impression that Edda is, is quite a, a rundown city with a lot of tristesse, etc. Uh, by the way, the, the real order is actually a combination of very pretty areas and places, like you can see here. Very colorful, uh, nice people, pedestrian areas, etc., etc. And the other half is basically shut down uh, industry leftovers. So the factory on the peninsula is still active. Uh, within town, most of, if not all, of the factory uh, or factories there were shut down like I think one or two decades ago already. And if you take a, a close look to the lens choices and the choices of, of uh, point of uh, angle of view and, and, and perspective, etc., you will immediately see how very carefully they chose uh, or, or, or decided what is to be seen in the background to support the story. Let me give you some examples. So this is my favorite shot of the, the usual mansion. I replicated that one when I was in Odder. Uh, so the lens I used uh, was a it was a zoom and the full uh, frame equivalent would be around 170 millimeters in, in focal length. And uh, so everything is very compressed, uh, the angle is very narrow, and uh, on, the, on the top right, uh, what you can see, that's a leftover from the goods cable car, the goods cable car uh, that's uh, connecting this part of the factory building to the building where Magna and Vida had their, their big fight end of season one and uh, these these two holes so it, it's really it, it, it seems like it's watching you okay in addition to the usual mention watching you from from far behind and they always make sure you can only see um, what you should see in the background another example would be the the rundown petrol station so uh, here they always make sure that you see the petrol station, which looks pretty run down, the workshop in the background, and then this building on the other side, which is not very pretty, okay? Now, fun fact, if you would pan the camera to the right, you would see that there is a very modern, very new petrol station, but it wouldn't make sense to show that one. 
uh, because it was never in frame, because otherwise uh, you would not give the impression that um, Oda or Edda is, 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 is a rundown city. Plus, you couldn't be able to explain why Vidar should go there to, to buy petrol. Uh, and because he is meeting Turit, I think it was the, the first episode of the, of the first season, because the wealthy man like Vidar would go to the nicer place, okay? He wouldn't go to this rundown petrol station. Then uh, a last example. Uh, where Lauritz, the, the place where Lauritz is, is, is uh, held the, the, the speech dressed as uh, Ran in the, uh, in the last uh, episode of the first season. This place doesn't seem very large um, in the series or in the episode already. And they used very, very low angles to film, also very narrow, just to, to, to make sure that it's, it's not it's, it's coming across as okay-ish, okay? I, when I was watching it, I really saw it's not the biggest place already. But in reality, this place is tiny. It's tiny. So compared to how, it, the, how it's, um, it's coming across in the, in the series, it's, it's, it's nothing like that. It's, it's a really, really tiny place. So, next point. CGI VFX SFX, okay? They used this really, really carefully. I just saw the teaser of season three, and I think it will be a bit different in this season, maybe a lot different, which is okay, because it's the final, okay? The, the final season, end game, gods against the giants. So you would expect uh, some more explosions, etc., VFX, etc. But in, in season one and two, they, they used it very, very well. So like uh, just some lenses, uh, contact lenses uh, for the giants, some digital effects on the eyes, some little, little items added here and there, like the, the wires where Isolde is crashing into, uh, they don't exist in reality, some, some morphing. And all this is to, to, support, the, to, to uh, support the story. And um, the interesting thing is most of the effects anyone could do within like a week watching YouTube tutorials for Da Vinci Resolve Fusion, for example. Uh, and then the sound design, they really made sure that it, you have the, the, the right sound uh, in, in the scene. So as an example, I was filming the YouTube factory and the original sounds, you had a lot of gulls screaming. Like, ding, ding, ding. So you, it really felt like a nice, beautiful day at the Northern Sea, right? which would completely, completely ruin the shot of the factory, which should be oh, dark, dangerous. So they made also sure that they had the, the, the right sounds um, in the scene. And it's, it's a great example of letting the storytelling decide the effects being used and not the effects dictating the story. And I, I really, really love that because that's relaxing to see, to, to, to this is good filmmaking craft work and it's it's coming back. It's not like the next next effects, uh, special effects. So next item, the acting. From my perspective, I'm German, I'm living in Germany. I would call the, the acting uh, European acting, okay? Just to give it a name. It's, it's very organic. So it's, it's like as it was being filmed as a documentary. So they, they are not overacting. So the opposite of what I mean would be the typical Tom Cruise acting. You know? Like every emotion is to be taken serious. You know? Yes, I'm happy. Yeah, yeah, I'm happy. And I'm sad. Okay. So and everything is drama. Everything is drama. So it's completely opposite in, in Ragnarok. Uh, it's, it's really good acting, very organic, very natural. And I, I really like liked that one. Um, and now the, the last point, which is also very important uh, for me, is that Ragnarok is not lecturing the audience. So what I mean by that is that in the, uh, in the past years, I, I really found that, um, how should I call it, the, the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the large media companies are, were producing something like I would call checklist productions. Okay, so they've got a list of items that need to be in 
the script and then they add it to the script which completely destroys the, the story sometimes because it happened so often to me that there was something in the scene suddenly and I was thinking what motivated this one okay so on the one hand I can understand that these uh, huge media companies um, uh, want to 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 kind of commercially get get uh, the the most out of these on Vogue Vogue topics on Vogue is on Vogue funny thing <laughs> commercially I can understand it but it in, in in most cases it's completely destroying the story and with Ragnarok there are some topics that would be on this checklist okay so like environmentalism climate change etc etc but it's built into the story very nicely because it's it's like the the grown-ups fighting against uh, the adults a little bit like everybody does when he's young okay but it's within the story and it's not lecturing um, the audience, which I really love. It's just part of the story, okay? To give, to create a very good story and to motivate the different storylines. So if you're interested in filmmaking, making, I'm really, really encouraging you to, to take a deep dive into Ragnarok and check out some of the scenes, okay? And, and analyze them. So just, Take a look. What what kind? What what are they showing in the background? What kind of color grading are they using? And uh, what sounds can you hear, etc., etc. Okay. So now to the the team that created Ragnarok. So I'm I'm really really thankful. So thanks a lot for keeping this whole series Norwegian style, European style, because that way it's. It's much more accessible to the viewer, in my opinion, as, at least for, for a German-Norwegian uh, audience. And I really would love to, to interview Adam Price, I think is the, the main author, or some of the, the other writers and producers that worked on the series, because I'm really interested in um, how this all happened. Uh, is was one of them growing up in other has he relatives in other uh, where did the ideas come from etc etc and in addition a special thanks for uh, creating the the name Wotan Wagner and for, for those of you wondering why Wotan is a character which was created by the German composer Richard Wagner and Wotan is referring to Wodan, and Wodan is the German name of Odin, the god Odin. So Wotan Wagner is a kind of homage to Richard Wagner, Richard Wagner. Love it. Thanks for that, guys. So now I'm trying to do some predictions, or I'm, I'm giving you my, my wish list, what I hope will be answered in the final season. Okay, so first one, where do the powers of Magna really come from? So this is a question directly connected to the question uh, of the history uh, of the, the family of Magna because um, Turit got pregnant uh, by Vida which, with Lauritz which was said to be impossible so there must be something in the family and uh, then Vida, in, in the fight they had, uh, Magna and Vida, the fight they had end of season one um, Vida, when they were fighting, was also mentioning that uh, Magne is a wimp like his father or something like this. So there is a connection on some history between Vida, Vida and uh, Magne's father. Plus, um, Lauritz, uh, I think it was episode one or two, uh, Lauritz was referring to the runes, this S rune. Uh, La uh, the grandfather of Magne was using to mark his tools. Okay, and it's a rune, it's Nordic. So there must be something um, behind, behind that. So I, I hope you are getting some answers to this one. Next one would be uh, Lauritz and the, the Misgard Serpent. So will Lauritz stand with his brother? Will Lauritz stand with the giants? Or will Lawrence stand with himself? And will the Serpent be a kind of item for conflict between um, Magne and Laos again, so like Vida was. So Magne killed Vida, uh, big big problem, big drama. I'm very interested how this is um, will evolve. 
And then concerning uh, Magna and Saxa, so will there be a kind of true love story? Or is Saxa, what's the real character of Saxa? Is she a nice person? Is she not a nice person? Or, will the, or is she only searching for some kind of empowerment or uh, support or tactics um, to, to get into power again within her pack? Uh, or clan, okay? And then concerning Gree, is she part of the series of the last season? And uh, if she is coming back, will she be focused on Fjor? Will she be focused on Magne? Will there be something between these three? And is Fjor, will he stick to, to all evil or not? Because as, as these four giants are being portrayed, it's like the older ones in this season, like uh, Ran and uh, Vidar, they are portrayed to be the more evil ones and the younger ones, um, Saxa and, and Fjord, they are portrayed at the more like the, the more, um, uh, how it's called, I'm missing the English word, uh, the more the, the modern ones, now, modern is not the um, progressive, yeah? the more progressive ones. So, um, Will there be more of, of these topics? Because of the evil ones, only one is, is, is left, basically, which is Ran. So that's it for this video. And uh, if you liked it, please give me a thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel and always remember to listen to more heavy metal. And um, if somebody of the Ragnarok team is seeing this, I would really love to interview one of you uh, to get some, some of the background. Uh, good job, guys. Really good job. Loved it. Thank you. See you soon next time.